the Hawaiian agricultural system. As we were walking down, after we went through the gate, you could see the walls there uh, across the slope. If you look down hill, you can see them now. And uh, they're like stair steps. They look like terraces, but they're not. They're, they're just walls in the field. And you'll see them in the middle mala where we're going. Um, they're the marker of this agricultural system, which was here for about 400 years um, before European contact, survived maybe 100 years into European contact and then disappeared. Um, it's a really interesting system because it was farmed intensively in the uplands for those 500 years, which is not something we know how to do for that long. You know, if you think of, of modern agriculture, it hasn't typically been sustained for more than decades. It probably can't be sustained for more than decades. But this was sustained for hundreds of years. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in here is how did they do that? Because that's something the world needs to know, that uh, Hawaiians have to teach the world. Systems like this are found only in Hawaii. If you go across Polynesia, there's nothing like this elsewhere in Polynesia. So it was, an, uh, it was a Hawaiian invention here. Um, we know for this particular one that uh, people probably when they came to Hawaii first settled in places like Waipio, um, where Mele is from, which are just wonderful places where you can grow anything in rich soil with lots of water. And they had a historical um, connection with loi, taro, taro patties that they developed in places like Waipio. They then, after, as they filled up places like Waipio, they spread a lot around the coast, focusing on the ocean, including this coast, and they practiced shifting cultivation, slash and burn agriculture in the uplands, which is a system that is widespread in Polynesia and everywhere in the world's tropics. It involves cutting forest, burning it, and then planting crops. Um, and typically you grow crops for a year or two and then abandon it back to forest, often shaping the composition of the forest when you do. And leave it in forest for 20 or 30 years and then come back around and cut it again, burn it again. And that enriches the soil. The cutting the forest and burning it accumulates nutrients, increases the fertility, allows you to get a crop in a place that you couldn't otherwise get it. It's a wonderfully sustainable system as long as you keep the forest in place for long enough. But it has the consequence that land isn't used efficiently. You're only using about 10% or less of the land to grow crops in any given year. So you can't power a complex society with that. You can't power and people who are doing things other than being farmers in that society. What we know happened here is that people discovered that they could, uh, by putting in infrastructure, the field walls, um, and practices that they developed, they could farm every year or almost every year. And so they could use the land efficiently and produce a surplus over the labor of the people doing the cultivation. And so it was that surplus that allowed Hawaii to become a nation, because without a surplus, you can't play a role in society other than farmer. You can't be an artist, a warrior, a dancer, a priest. There's no room for that in, in society. You have to have a food surplus to, to provide that. And no surplus, no nation. And Hawaii was a nation before European contact. And it was because of systems like this and because of the taro paddy systems on other islands thing is, on this island, there are only a few limited places like Waipio where you can grow taro in wetland systems. And so to have a nation on this island, you had to do something else. And what they did was they developed systems like this one, which stretches 12 miles this way along the uh, slope here. And it's about two miles wide. So it's, we, think, we say it's like 26 square miles. So intensively cultivated land. What they did was they came around when they were close to the coast, 
in the north of this land. They started there and developed this agricultural system and spread it gradually about this far. Then about 1600 AD, the evidence is that they all of a sudden extended it another four miles. It goes to that little bump on the horizon there, which is Pu Kahua, um, to the right of the lowest cinder cone that's on the horizon. There's a little bump on the horizon. That's the end of this agricultural system. And then they sustained this agricultural system for <clears throat> another 200 years until European contact. When European diseases, Europeans came in, they brought diseases to Hawaii. Probably 90% of Hawaiians died of those diseases. They brought cattle and cattle were released to this landscape under kapu from the chiefs. It was forbidden to take or kill cattle. And so the cattle loved the gardens that were grew here and the people were dying and this land takes a lot of, of labor to maintain an intensive agricultural system more than taro paddies do once the irrigation system is built and so the land was abandoned under the pressure of cattle and under the pressure of lack of labor people moved into the developing cities and interacted with european colonists and moved into the valleys, which now had openings in them because so many people had died of disease. And so the, the, this land was abandoned. And it's been sitting under ranch management now for over a hundred years, locked away behind locked gates. And so we're trying to bring people back to the land because the system needs people. You're the people who will be putting the labor into the land here. And um, that's, that's what the system requires, is work, labor, hand labor, to uh, make it work. And uh, Mele and Kehau are the overseers who will be telling you what to do. You'll be putting the work into the land to make it uh, burdened again, to make it productive again. And uh, we know that uh, on this island, we calculate that about 95% of the staple food that powered the nation that was this island came from field systems like this that were invented in Hawaii, um, not from the taro paddies at all. It's in contrast, if you go to the island of Kauai on the far northwest of the archipelago, 100% of the food that came from big field systems came from Lo'i there. It was a taro-driven economy with um, irrigated taro being the staple. Here it was rain-fed sweet potatoes that powered the complex society of Hawaii, of Hawaii Island. And not surprisingly, if you look back into uh, the oral tradition, because you know Hawaiian was not a written language, it is now, um, there is no written history that you can read. There's only the traditions that you can, that were passed on orally, often written down after European contact in Hawaiian language. Um, it's clear that there were four different nations in Hawaii. This island, Maui and the islands that are close to it, Molokai, Lanai, and Kaholavi, Oahu, and Kauai and Niihau were separate nations and they were often in conflict with each other. The conflict was um, typically initiated by Hawaii Island, where the, these rain-fed field systems were, and uh, involved the fact that it was it takes a lot of labor to produce a surplus here. So the chiefs could easily say, hey, you know, if we were over there, we wouldn't have to work so hard to get the food that we're due. And so there was lots of raiding towards the older islands to the northwest. Uh, one of the things that we know is in Hawaiian history is after contact Kamehameha, who was the first chief of the whole archipelago, was a product of this field system. He was born and grew up in this field system. And he organized an army that conquered the archipelago and brought it under one rulership for the first time in history. And 
he did so, you know, making use of European weapon, making use of the weapons of the colonizers. But it wasn't colonization dynamics that so often is the case that were involved. It was Hawaiian dynamics playing out with Kamehameha exploiting the colonizers technology to achieve Hawaiian political ends rather than the colonizer using Hawaiians to achieve colonizer political ends. Um, Hawaii was then a unified nation for about a century until the U.S. Um, participated in the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom by uh, local white sugar planters who overthrew the kingdom and eventually Hawaii was an annexed by the U.S. and became part of the United States. There's no argument that the overthrow itself was illegal. The participation of the U.S. government in the overthrow was illegal. Um, but it, it's a historical fact. It is what happened. I like to think about this land in terms of how it looked at different times. Had we been standing up here um, 20,000 years ago, what would we have seen? If we'd been standing up here 2,000 years ago and so forth. And it's one of the things we know from work here is that 20,000 years ago was the ice ages on Earth, was the full glacial time, when the sea level was about 450 feet lower than it is now. And all of the islands of Maui were combined into one big island. The biggest island then was Maui, um, not this island. And then we would have seen tree line coming down. We would have seen glaciers on Mauna Kea and probably Mauna Loa as well. Um, and we would have seen a very cold, sparse forest in this place 20,000 years ago. If we came 2,000 years ago, which is a good date because it's before Hawaiians were here, um, because Hawaiians, you know, people argue about when Hawaiians arrived, when Hawaiians discovered Hawaii. Um, the numbers vary from about 800 years ago to about 2,000 years ago. But uh, 2,000 years ago, it's clear that nobody was here. If we'd been looking out here, we would have seen unbroken forests going from the mountains all the way to the coast, getting sparser as it went down. In front of us would have been what we call mesic forest, intermediate forest, not wet, not dry. Um, a very productive and diverse forest, by far the most diverse that is in Hawaii. Most of that is gone now. The wet forest remains, although it's been pushed back. You can see remnants of it on the cinder cones there, and there's an unbroken extent of it to the um, windward of us here. That's mainly the ohia tree that's in that forest, but the ohia tree would have been in one element, but not the only element of, of this forest. As we went farther down, you would have gotten into dry forest, uh, the willy willy tree and some others that um, <coughs> is still extant. There are still dry forests in Hawaii on areas where it's too rocky to farm. There are very few mesic forests left in Hawaii. There's lots of wet forests left because it's very hard to cultivate very hard to make use of for any purpose, indigenous or, or um, modern. That, uh, that forest is a, is a very difficult thing to work with. So if we come here a thousand years ago, before this field system was intensified, but let's say that was when there were Hawaiians on the land, and maybe it was, would have been 500 years ago. Probably they aren't different 500 and a thousand years ago. Um, we would have seen patches of slash and burn agriculture out here, but not, uh, there have been patches of forest and patches of agriculture. Most of the matrix would have been forest. Um, if we'd come just before European contact, if we'd come 400 years ago, we would have seen this system in full operation um, with the field walls and continuous cultivation extending almost as far as we could see in both directions here. It would have been a very productive land, 
under very strong management. Um, <clears throat> if we had come, if we're here now, we know what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing ranch land. We're seeing the fact that uh, Western society, modern society, has not found ways to rejuvenate this breadbasket that this land was in Hawaiian time. And so they're growing cattle here, which is a very inefficient use of land, like shifting cultivation is. It, you, you don't, you know, the cattle are eating the grass, we're eating the cattle. Um, you get less than 10% of the energy that's in the grass that way. Um, and so it's much like shifting cultivation in that less than 10% of the productivity of the land is going into people. Um, and it's the, it's the best and most economic thing that modern society has found to do with this land. Um, but it would be really interesting if we could rejuvenate the productivity of the land, the agricultural yields of the land, and develop a system where um, this land once again provided much of its yields as food for people, not the would never be 100%, but it could be, you know, half of the yield of the land, half of the productivity of the land could be food for people in a place like this. And that's something that we would lo love to see. One question that I like to ask is, if we came here in 50 years in the future, what would we see? You know, um, several possibilities are there. One is that things won't change. This would be ranch land, like it is now. Um, the ranchers are, are typically here good managers. They know what they're doing. They're, they're capable people. They work with the land in order to maximize the productivity of cattle. Another possibility is that uh, you could see ranches, ranchettes, ranch estates here, um, as the land is sold off to uh, wealthy people coming from the mainland who want to live on their five or ten acre parcels. That is probably the way that would bring the most economic return to the landowners now. Um, it's also probably the, my least favorite vision of the future. Another vision of the future you could imagine is that the land becomes productive agriculturally again and that uh, it once again feeds Hawaii. Now Hawaii imports somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of our food uh, from elsewhere. And even though the land was extraordinarily productive, we believe there were more people living on this island at the time of European contact than live here now. Um, and they were completely fed by local resources. There was no import of, of uh, food, of course. There was no import of fertilizer or other resources. It was completely a local, locally based economy. And uh, they managed to feed more people and do so more sustainably than we're capable of, we seem to be capable of doing now. So you could imagine a future in which that was restored and where the land became rich again in terms of feeding us a, a modern society. And the learning from that process was sent worldwide because there are lots of places in the world that don't have enough food and don't have enough resources. And Hawaiian technology that was invented in the time before European contact could contribute to food security worldwide in lots of places around the world. So our vision of the future could be rejuvenation of, of crop yields here and transfer of that information globally in a way that made things good for the world, not just for Hawaii. And you know, that's the vision that we're all working on and that we um, believe has <clears throat> some reasonable chance of success, else we wouldn't be wasting our lives doing it. Um, and, uh, but it's a long shot. And it, it, it depends on 
being able to show the yield that the land can yield when labor is applied to it. And so we're really appreciative of you bringing your labor to the land and making your contribution to showing that this land could be productive and could make a sustainable yield of agriculture, uh, agricultural products in the long term. You know, you'll see that uh, we're growing crops here, including the traditional Hawaiian crops and some others as well. Um, you know, it, it's, people often ask, why aren't you just growing Hawaiian crops? You know, what isn't the idea showing to show what Hawaiians could have done? Well, my sense is that um, Hawaiians were tremendously dynamic and innovative, and had they had access to the world's crops rather than the ones they brought on their canoes from the South Pacific, they would have grown a greater variety of things than they grew in practice. Um, and that uh, the idea is not to recreate what was in the past, but to develop a system based on Hawaiian knowledge that will take us into the future. Just as we believe that the uh, Hawaiian cultivators would have done had they had access to those resources. And you know, one of the things that uh, it's tempting for people to think when you talk about what the system will look like in 50 years, what would it have looked like now had uh, Europeans never arrived in Hawaii, had the system just continued to evolve under Hawaiian direction? And I think the answer to that question is unknowable. We don't know what it would have looked like. One thing we know it would not have looked like is exactly what it looked like at European contact, because Hawaiian society was so innovative and so dynamic that uh, they'd changed so much in the 200 plus years before that in how they managed land. They would have continued to evolve and change. And the system that we would have seen in front of us now had Europeans never arrived would have been had elements of the system that was here uh, at the time of European contact, but would have evolved into a better system under Hawaiian management then. Because, you know, we think it's, it's something that uh, is not well appreciated just how innovative and dynamic Hawaiian society was. It was a tremendously inventive society. It invented agricultural systems like this. It invented aquacultural systems like fish ponds that I'm sure you'll be visiting in your time here. And uh, they had the those fishing lures and stuff. Hmm? They, they had fishing, right? Like the fish hooks and everything. They, they did that, but those fish hooks were, were Polynesian. They were? They, oh. they were, yeah. And the thing is, here they um, didn't have the kinds of shells they have in the South Pacific, so they couldn't make big one-piece trolling fish hooks. So they made two-piece hooks. They innovated a way of making hooks that was that made use of local resources. But the fish hooks mm -hmm. themselves, the, and the fishing technology is Polynesian. The fish pond technology is, is Hawaiian. It was invented here and uh, doesn't exist anywhere else in Polynesia. And so we know that uh, society was really inventive and really creative, really good at developing uh, new ways of doing things. And it's that that we think it's most important that uh, young Hawaiians, many of whom are brought here by Mele and Kehau, understand about the past, that uh, society was not one in which people just did whatever the elders said and put that into practice generation after generation. It was a dynamic, innovative, and evolutionary society that did some really interesting new things on, on the land in this area. Any other questions on, on this stuff?